Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pack and welcome to Threshold of Hope, our chance to bring you the writings of Pope John Paul the Great. And before we get to uh, today's text, which is Radom Taurus Missio, the encyclical, uh, I'd like to take a look at a couple emails. Remember, you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Uh, first one, Father Mitch, I read in True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort that we should offer Holy Communion to God through the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. However, during Mass, there is a prayer the priest says, asking that God's angel take our sacrifice and offer it to God. Can it be possible to ask Mary and God's angel to take our sacrifice and offer it to God for us? And, yes, it is possible. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we do at every Mass, you, know, you were talking about Eucharistic prayer number one. That's the only one that mentions uh, uh, the request that the angels take the sacrifice to the uh, heavenly altar. Uh, the others don't mention the angels uh, taking the sacrifice. But every Eucharistic prayer, not only in the Western Rite, but also in the Eastern Rites, includes a mention of Our Lady. And this is a very important point because, if you remember, the Mass is the representation of Mount Calvary. This is the death of Jesus represented for us in a sacramental way, in an unbloody way. And the Blessed Mother was standing at the cross. That's why we always mention you know, the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary during the Eucharistic prayers. It's always part of it. And uh, it's, again, it's not only Catholic, but also Eastern Orthodox. Uh, so, so this is a, a good thing to do. Include Our Lady in this. And then another one. Dear Father Mitch, several months ago you had a Najimo Awad on EWTN Live. Something he said struck me, and I want your thoughts on the matter. He said that in the Old Testament, God used nature to bring people to conversion. And that in the New Testament, he used his son, Jesus the Word, to bring them to conversion. It made me wonder if that is what is going on now, since we as a nation and world have stopped listening to his word. He must resort to nature once again to get our attention. Your thoughts, and this is from Patricia Shirk. Um, well, Patricia, the Lord can use and still does use nature. And I wouldn't say that it's going to be an exclusive use of nature, but he can speak to us through natural phenomena. Uh, there's certainly the beauty of sunset, but there's also the, uh, and we have to do the, deal with this carefully, uh, but there's also the reality of forces of nature that are painful forces of nature. And the Lord can speak to us through those as well. So uh, the reason I say we, we must be careful about that is because sometimes the forces of nature strike, as a matter of fact, most of the time, they strike both the good and the bad. And it's not that, you know, for instance, the hurricane, Irene, for instance, only goes after bad people. It also affects good people. And so we have to be very cautious about how we understand that nature is using us. The drought in Texas is uh, affecting good people as well as bad people. Uh, and our Lord said the same thing, that he causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on both the good and the bad alike. So nature can be a more um, complicated way of speaking to us. So we have to be cautious about that, uh, lest we, we figure, think we can figure out. I know some of the politicians have tried to make jokes about these things, but you know, it's not a joking matter. And it's one that we have to be very, very cautious about what we say, lest we think that we understand exactly what God is saying through nature. Uh, nature is uh, more complicated than that. And we have to uh, be alert to understanding God's word because that is a clearer way of God to speak to us. 
and we must learn God's word, and then we must speak God's word to the people around us so that they can hear not something as vague as what nature might say, but understand the clarity of revelation and apply it to them. All right. We are going through the document, the encyclical, Radum Taurus Missio, which means Mission of the Redeemer. And you can download a free copy of this encyclical at our website, EWTN.com. One way to do it is to go to the television tab of our website, click EWTN Live Shows, and then you'll see an array of programs. Click on Threshold of Hope. And when you do that, you can watch last week's show if you missed it. And you can download this document that we're going through right there on that page. Or if you prefer, you can visit EWTN's document library under encyclicals. And you can also uh, download the document from there. We are on paragraph 66. And if you recall from last week, this is a section that is dealing with, uh, uh, well, the, the whole chapter is dealing with those who have leadership and are workers in the missions. And last week we concluded by uh, talking about a section on the missionary orders. We didn't finish that, so we'll continue on from paragraph 66 about the missionary institutes. These missionary institutes draw from their experience and creativity. They learn a lot from being in the mission and from the creativity in the mission. Uh, one of my favorite stories of creativity in the mission is from Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit who went to China in the 17th century. And he had a clock sent to him from Europe. European clocks were of a superior quality to Chinese clocks. So he, he gave a clock to the emperor of China. However, Matteo Ricci kept the key. And it required the emperor to give personal permission for any foreigner to enter into the palace. So every day, the emperor had to give permission for Matteo Ricci to come into the palace in order to wind up the clock. He got tired of that, and he gave Matteo Ricci a room in the palace. And from there, Father Ricci began to convert the princes of the Chinese Empire. That was clever. That was very clever. So we learn from creativity and experience while remaining at the same time faithful to their founding charism. Remember, a charism is the gift that is key to the order. Some orders are founded with the charism of being medical missionaries. Some are pastoral missionaries. Uh, some go in to preach and teach and so on. So they each have their own founding charism that comes through the founder of the order. And these missionary orders must employ all means necessary to ensure the adequate preparation of candidates and the renewal of their members' spiritual, moral, and physical energies. Now, this is something that uh, is reflected in Agentes. Agentes is the Vatican II document on the missions. And in paragraph 24, it said, the heralds of the gospel, lest they neglect the grace which is in them, should be renewed day by day in the spirit of their mind. Their ordinaries, that is their superiors, or bishops, I should say, and superiors, should gather the missionaries together from time to time, that they be strengthened in the hope of their calling and may be renewed in the apostolic ministry, even in houses expressly set up for this purpose, so that there should be time for renewal of missionaries. 
No, they work very hard and they can get burnt out. So they need to find renewal. They should sense that they are a vital part of the ecclesial community. Missionaries are a vital part of the church and we should never forget that and they should forget it. And that they carry on their missionary work in communion with the whole church. So they're not off doing their own thing. They are working as part of the church. Indeed, as it says in another document uh, on uh, secular institutes and religious congregations, uh, the document is called Mutue Relaciones, paragraph 14b, where it says every institute exists for the church and must enrich her with its distinctive characteristics according to a particular spirit and a specific mission. Religious, therefore, should cultivate a renewed ecclesial awareness by offering their services for the building up of the body of Christ, by persevering in fidelity to their rule, and by obeying their superiors. These are the things that are going to support the missionary orders in their activity. In general, missionary institutes came into being in churches located in traditionally Christian countries. So the Divine Word Fathers started in Europe uh, and many other orders of missionaries started in Europe and came to the United States uh, and to Africa, Asia, Oceania, Latin America. Though some were founded in, in America uh, as well. And historically, missionary institutes have been the means employed by the Congregation of Propaganda Fide. Propaganda Fide is the Roman congregation. This is part of the Vatican's own offices. And Propaganda Fide means propagating the faith. And it is oriented towards the missions. It's the official Vatican office that deals with the missions. And that they are used by Congregation uh, Propaganda Fide for the spread of the faith and for founding of new churches. That's their role of these missionary orders, to start new churches in these different countries and to spread the faith. Today, these missionary institutes are receiving more and more candidates from the young churches. So Africa is giving many members to these missionary orders, uh, which, which uh, young churches which they themselves founded. So the missionaries founded the churches in Africa. Now the Africans are sending members to these missionary orders. And in addition to that, new missionary institutes have arisen in countries which previously only received missionaries. So that there are new orders of missionary uh, priests, brothers, and sisters in Africa, which are sending missionaries to other places in Africa itself, but into uh, other continents as well. This is a praiseworthy trend which demonstrates the continuing validity and relevance of the specific missionary vocation of these missionary institutes. They're absolutely necessary, not only for the missionary activity agentes, but also for keeping, uh, in keeping with their tradition. These missionary orders are necessary for stirring up missionary fervor in the churches of the traditionally Christian countries. Christian countries need to see that there are still missionaries going out from them. 
and that uh, they're also necessary for the younger churches because the younger churches, to maintain their vitality, need to send missionaries to other places. They will see their own strength grow and increase by sending out missionaries. And this is confirmed in Agentes, again, the document, Vatican II document on missions, paragraph 27. For these reasons, and since there are still many nations to be led to Christ, the missionary institutes remain extremely necessary. So this is a very important point. The special vocation of missionaries for life, that's one of the things about them, that they are missionaries, they belong to these missionary orders, and they're going to be missionaries for their whole life long. It won't be something they do as part of their time in uh, the, the priesthood or the religious life. That's what I did. I was sent to Peru for a short time, but I wasn't a missionary for life. The missionary orders are missionaries for their whole life long. And that this missionary uh, vocation for life uh, retains all its validity. It is the model of the church's missionary commitment, which always stands in radical need of total self-giving. That's one of the things about these missionaries. They give of themselves. They go away for their whole life long. And they serve God in these other countries, no matter what else might be going on, no matter how good things might be back at home, no matter what needs of their families, they give themselves in total self-giving. And it's also possible for them to do new and bold endeavors, starting new missions and being bold to go into countries that have not yet heard of Christ. Therefore, the men and women missionaries who have devoted their whole lives to bearing witness to the risen Lord among the nations must not allow themselves to be daunted by doubts. Some of the, see, this is one of the things that there was an ideology that mostly came from America and Europe saying that maybe we should not be doing these missions. Maybe the missionary activity is no longer relevant and that just let everybody find their own way to God with their own religion. And the Pope is saying, don't be daunted by these doubts or misunderstanding. Uh, some people misunderstand the mission and say, oh, this is just part of imperialism. That's not why the missionaries go. They don't go to promote any empires. They go to promote the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Nor should they be daunted by rejection or persecution when they get to another country. They should revive the grace of their specific charism, the charism of being a missionary order, like the Divine Word Fathers and many other groups, and courageously press on preferring in a spirit of faith, obedience, and communion with their pastors, the bishops, to seek the lowliest and most demanding places, that they can seek out the poorest of places and the most demanding places. Usually the poor have a lot of demands, not because the poor are rude, but because there's so many needs among them. And that's what makes it demanding. And that's where they should seek, it, seek out their, their work. Now, the next paragraph, 67, deals with another topic for the next couple paragraphs, namely diocesan priests for the universal mission. So these are not order priests, but diocesan priests. Priests are, first of all, co-workers with the bishops. The bishop has the fullness of priesthood. We ordained priests share in his work. And priests 
are called by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders to share in a concern for the church's mission. Concern for the church's mission belongs not just to special orders, but it belongs to the priest by the very fact that they have been ordained. And in the Vatican II document on the priesthood, Presbyterorum Ordinus, paragraph 10, it says, the spiritual gift which priests receive at their ordination prepared them not for a sort of limited and narrow mission, but for the widest possible and universal mission of salvation, even to the ends of the earth. For every priestly ministry shares in the universality of the mission entrusted by Christ to his apostles. Now, why would he bring up this universality? Well, one of the reasons is most priests are ordained for a specific diocese, that they are ordained to work in a specific diocese under the bishops of that diocese. And for the most part, they don't travel beyond their own diocese. That would be the case of the majority of diocesan priests. But the Pope wants to remind priests that they do have a universal mission and that this is the task that is given to them because the priesthood was given to the apostles in its fullness and from them passed on to the bishops in its fullness and then a share in that priesthood comes to the ordained priests and it has the same universal outlook as the apostles and priests should not neglect that universal outlook. For this reason, the formation of candidates to the priesthood, the formation of seminarians, must have some specific aims. And in Optatum Totius, the Vatican II document on seminary training, paragraph 20, it said, let them also be imbued with that truly Catholic spirit which will accustom them to transcend the limits of their own diocese, nation, or right, and to help the needs of the whole church prepared in spirit to preach the gospel everywhere. This is going to be part of the task of priests, that the, yes, they are ordained for specific dioceses, but they also need to have a view of going beyond their diocese. Uh, a friend of mine is a priest from the St. Louis Diocese, Father Joe Classen, and he has been sent off to do missionary work in Alaska, where there are very few priests. A lot of moose, plenty of bears, and, but, but, and wolves, but no, not too many priests. So he's gone off over there, uh, way far from his own home diocese. He's an example of many other priests. There was a priest that taught me when I was in high school, seminary, who also was called to, you know, allowed by the diocese to go to the Alaska missions. You know, this is something that happens that some priests will pick up. All priests must have the mind and heart of missionaries. Even if you're in the middle of a large city in America or Europe, you must have the heart and mind of a missionary. That means you are open to the needs of the church and the world. And that you have, as a priest, concern for those farthest away especially for the non-Christian groups in their own area, because non-Christians migrate throughout the, the different areas of formerly Christian countries. 
uh, in traditionally Christian countries, and we should have a concern to bring them to know Christ. Uh, Europe has many Muslims. We have some. And we should have a concern to let them know who Jesus Christ is according to the Gospels. And this is um, uh, going to be especially for the non-Christian groups in their own area. They should have at heart in their prayers and especially at Mass, at the Eucharistic sacrifice. They should have the concern of the whole church for all of humanity. That's why it's very important in the prayers of the faithful that we have a very wide open concern for the church. We don't just pray for Joe's Pizzeria at the corner of 6th and, and Washington Avenue where the pizza is really good and we want them to have a great success. Lord, hear our prayer. No, we have a wide open vision of praying for the missions and, and praying uh, and drawing the whole congregation to have that same vision of concern for the rest of the church and not just a small part. Especially in those areas where Christians are a minority. So with the, in many places, Christians are a minority, even in some parts of the first world that were traditionally Christian. Now the number of practicing Christians is a small minority. Priests must be filled with the special missionary zeal and commitment of wanting to convert these people around them to the faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord entrusts to them not only the pastoral care of the Christian community, that's key, and they have to make sure they take care of the Christian community, but also and above all, the evangelization of those of their fellow citizens who do not yet belong to Christ's flock. So this is a concern in many countries. And Pope John Paul spoke in an address to the plenary session for the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples in April 1989. And he said, priests should not fail to make themselves readily available to the Holy Spirit first, that the Lord Holy Spirit wants to use them, and to the bishop. And we should keep in mind that the Holy Spirit uses the bishop to, to speak. So they should be readily available to the Holy Spirit and the bishop to be sent to preach the gospel beyond the borders of their country. This will demand of them not only maturity in their vocation, but also an uncommon readiness to detach themselves from their own homeland, culture, and family. And it requires a special ability to adapt to other cultures with understanding and respect for them, so that priests of the diocese should also be open to going to other countries and being able to understand other peoples besides their own, learning their languages, their customs, their ways of life, and being able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, freedom from sin, the avoidance of hell, and the promise of heaven. These are the kinds of things that they should be willing to preach to the souls to whom they go. And this is a great, uh, great mission for diocesan priests to undertake as well. All right, we're going to take a little break before we continue on with this section about diocesan priests. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, so please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you, and welcome back. Uh, I have some uh, exciting news. Uh, it's a programming note before we go to our questions. And that is we're excited that Threshold of Hope is expanding. It's going to start into a new time slot, not change the old time slots. We're going to have all the, the, the time slots uh, that like this present time, it'll still be on at this time of uh, uh, night and it'll be on the next morning as usual. Uh, so all of that's going to stay the same, but there's going to be an additional time slot for, EW, uh, for Threshold of Hope uh, beginning next week. You can see Threshold of Hope Threshold of Hope live on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. It'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, not only will we continue to break down the teachings of the church and luminaries like bless, Blessed uh, Pope John Paul the Great, but also Pope Benedict XVI, Vatican II, and others. And we'll continue to take your emails and questions from our live studio audience along with something brand new for Threshold of Hope. We hope we'll make the show more interactive. Starting next week, you can phone in your questions and comments as well. We want to hear from you. So don't miss out on all these different ways that you can be part of the show. Phone-ins at 2 o'clock Eastern time, and figure out your own time zone from there. Uh, as well as emails and live studio questions. So it'll be very exciting to, to do that. Also, we've got a nice audience here. I'd like to invite you to be part of our live audience so that you can say on your phone bill. No, it's our phone bill. You call the 800 number. <laughs> but it'd be nice to have you come and join us and be part of the studio audience so you can ask questions uh, here in the studio. If you can, uh, make a pilgrimage down here, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, for more information about where you can stay, uh, schedules for shows, uh, for the masses, and they'll give you information on how to get to Hansville to see the sisters. So we'd love to have all that go on. And finally, I also want to mention that I will be taking another group on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. That'll be December 15th to the 26th. And as we usually do, we're planning on spending Christmas Eve in Bethlehem. So uh, if you can come and join us, please do so. Uh, the weather is very nice at that time of year. Uh, in, in general, you know, it's been very, uh, all the years we've been going, the weather's been very nice. Uh, only once did we have uh, rain. So um, it be lo lovely to have you come and join us. The phone number is 1-800-554-4556. That's 1-800-554-4556. Or go to my website, www.fathermitchpacwood.org to get more information about joining us for that pilgrimage. Uh, it'd be really nice to have you with us. All right, now let's go to get some questions from our studio audience. Let's start off with this lady here. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Milford, Pennsylvania, Father. And is, uh, were you hit by that uh, hurricane? Well, we've been up here since, and we heard electricity is a bit of a problem. But yeah. other than that, it seems like it's OK. Oh, good, good. Thank good, God. Good. Yeah, really. Um, what is your question? Well, Father, you had mentioned that um, missionary priests are priests for life. And I was wondering if a diocesan priest can change his course of action, become a missionary, a missionary for life. Yes. Yes, he can. Um, when I was talking about uh, missionary orders, where they take a vow to be missionaries for their whole life long, that is one way. But uh, missionary uh, diocesan priests can, with the permission of their bishop and the bishop of the diocese to which they go, 
can be missionaries for their whole life long. You know, one of the things about uh, many missionaries is that they fall completely in love with the church that they're serving and they want to stay. Uh, uh, I knew of a diocesan priest who went down to the jungles of Latin America, the Amazon jungle, and he just felt, felt totally in love with it and stayed there his whole life. Yeah, so, so that would be very possible, and many others do the same. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, where are you from? Hello, I'm Rebecca. I'm from Collins Center in New York. Great, Buffalo. and what's your question? I have a question about how an area changes from being a missionary area or a missionary church to mm -hmm. an, an ordinary church or a diocese. Yes, one of the things that happens, two things that happens, is first of all, the population of Catholics grows and that there are a large number of Catholics, large enough to require them for the second stage, which is to have their own bishop. And they, usually they start off with missionary clergy, but at some point they want to have a diocesan clergy coming from the community itself. And so what they'll do is they will uh, start to develop their own clergy under their own bishop. Uh, when we started off this encyclical, I described a mission that my province of Jesuits had worked in in uh, India. At the time they went, there were only a few thousand Christians in the whole state that they were in. Now, that mission has become an archdiocese with five suffragan dioceses along with it in the same territory. So there, so there, there, and then another one is in the process of being established. So this has been a, a great process. And you know, this is how things develop, okay? Sir, where are you from? Providence Forge, Virginia. Good to have you here. And what's your question? I was just wondering how we as the lay, the, the church community can best reach out to the fallen away Catholics within our country. Right. This is part of what Pope John Paul calls the new evangelization, where we re-evangelize people in our culture. And there are a number of ways that the laity do this mission. For instance, I knew one couple, uh, a permanent deacon and his wife, who went door to door in their parish and would give, in, you know, to say, look, uh, we're from the local Catholic uh, St. Matthew's Parish, and we'd like you to know of some of the services that we have available. And usually, uh, you know, this would begin a conversation. And it opened the door to a series of conversations by which many hundreds of people became Catholic who had not been Catholic, Many people decided, you know, I haven't been to church in a long time. Uh, what time is that Mass? And they also let them know the times for confessions. <laughs> Some of those people need that too. Uh, and uh, 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 that's one way to do it. Another way that's much more typical is we all meet individuals in our everyday walk of life. And these individuals you know, are just going about their business and we're usually going about our business. But you strike up friendships and you begin to talk about, uh, say, Joe, would you like to go golfing on Sunday? I said, no, I'm going to Sunday Mass. How would you like to come with me? You know, this would be a way to, to, to get started. And come over afterwards for breakfast. You know, th th these are ways you know, that, that are simple, that we can get started with an evangelization of our own culture. Every so often, people will discuss moral questions. And we, and we can say, because I'm a Catholic, I don't do that. Or for instance, the New York Times, just a couple days ago, had an article uh, that was making a certain amount of ridicule of believing that a priest has the authority 
to consecrate bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. This was on the editorial page of the New York Times. One more reason for me to be glad I don't give them any of my money. But at any rate, uh, that can be something that sparks, you know, when people know that you're a Catholic, that can spark a conversation. And you can say, this is why we believe that. And all sorts of, it, it means having an attentiveness to the circumstances around you so that you're always looking, how can I talk about Jesus? How can I bring him into this? And it, it means being alert to those conversations. And that's a way to do that. Okay? Thank you, You're welcome. All right. We are on paragraph 68, still talking about diocesan priests in the mission. Pope Pius XII wrote an encyclical called Fidei Donum, the gift of faith. And he wrote it uh, right around 1957 or so uh, with prophetic insight. He encouraged bishops to offer some of their priests for temporary service in the churches of Africa because in the 50s the African mission was just really beginning to blossom. As a matter of fact it began to blossom even more after the various empires. If you remember in the 50s and 60s the empires of Europe were losing their control over the countries of Africa. And the more the, the imperial uh, powers lost control of those countries, the better off the missionaries were. They were not uh, served well by being part of empires. And so he wanted them for temporary service in the churches of Africa. And Pope Pius XII gave his approval to projects already existing for that purpose. 25 years later, Pope John Paul II pointed out the striking newness of that encyclical. And he did this in uh, his message for World Mission Day, 1982, where he said, and this is the great novelty to which Fidei Donum has lent its name, a novelty that has surmounted the territorial dimension of the priestly service in order to destine it for the entire church, as the Vatican Council emphasizes, where he quotes from the Vatican Council, the spiritual gift which priests received at their ordination prepares them not for any limited and narrow mission, but for the widest scope of the universal mission of salvation even to the very ends of the earth. For every priestly ministry shares in the universality of the mission entrusted by Christ to his apostles, which uh, a, a quotation that we had from um, our Presbyterium Ordinus just a few minutes ago. Today it is clear how effective this experience has been of sharing priests from various dioceses to the dioceses of Africa. Indeed, Fidei Donum priests are a unique sign of the bond of communion existing among the churches. The, ch the different dioceses are not off by themselves. There is a bond of communion among all dioceses. And this is part of belonging to the universal church. The church has a global perspective, and we must never forget that. These Fidei Donum priests make a valuable contribution to the growth of needy ecclesial communities, while at the same time they draw from them freshness and liveliness of faith. Of course, the missionary service of the diocesan priest must conform to certain criteria and conditioning. In other words, they have to fit in to the new diocese. 
the priest to be sent should be selected from among the most suitable candidates, not the guys you can't do anything with, <laughs> not the leftovers, but the best, and should be duly prepared for the particular work that awaits them. With an open and fraternal attitude, these priests should become part of the new setting of the church, which welcomes them. They should be belong to that um, and form one presbyterate with the local priest and under the authority of the bishop. And in a document called Postquam Apostoli, paragraph 29, it says, priests who go to another diocese are to respect the bishop of that place and obey him according to the agreement. In their manner of life, they should adapt themselves to the conditions in which the native clergy live and should cultivate friendly relations with them, since altogether they make up the presbytery under the authority of the bishop, so that there should be a, a, a good mutual relationship. And I hope that a spirit of service will increase among the priests of long-established churches and will be fostered among priests of the churches of more recent origin. So this is what he has to say about the priests from the various dioceses, not religious order priests, but diocesan priests who are missionaries. Now in paragraph 69, he goes to the missionary fruitfulness of consecrated life, that is, of religious orders. From the inexhaustible and manifold richness of the spirit come the vocations of institutes of consecrated life, whose members, uh, as, as it says um, uh, in, in the uh, document on the Institutes of Consecrated Life, where it says, because of the dedication to the service of the church, deriving from their very consecration, they have an obligation to play a special part in missionary activity in a manner appropriate to their institute. So religious make a commitment of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and sometimes other vows. And they have particular roles to take because of their vows. History witnesses to the outstanding service rendered by the religious families in the spread of the faith and the formation of new churches. From the ancient monastic institutions to the medieval orders up to the more recent congregations. I think of an example. Germany was evangelized by the Benedictines, and Benedictine monasteries became the core of some German cities, like Salzburg in Austria, and uh, Munich in Germany, and Fulda in Germany, and many other places. And that these monasteries were the place from which Benedictine min, uh, missionaries radiated out and evangelized the countryside, bringing the pagans to Christ to know him. And then the medieval orders did the same, the, especially the Dominicans and the Franciscans. And then the more recent congregations, especially from the 1800s, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, Hundreds of new religious orders came about, and many of them went into the missions. We Americans are extremely grateful for those missionaries of various religious orders coming here. Echoing the Vatican Council, I invite institutes of contemplative life, that is, the, the Trappists and other contemplatives, to establish communities of monasteries in the young churches. In the Vatican II document on missions, Agentes, paragraph 40, it says, in fact, these institutes for contemplation are asked to found houses in mission areas, as not a few of them have already done, so that they're living out their lives in a way accommodated to the very religious traditions of the people, 
they can bear excellent wish, witness among non-Christians to the majesty and love of God, as well as to our union in Christ. A classic example of that were the Trappists in Algeria, who were all martyred. They were killed by some radicals. There's a movie that you can rent of gods and men that talks, that, that describes the, what happened to them. And I strongly urge that. This presence of contemplative uh, orders is beneficial throughout the non-Christian world, especially in those areas where religious traditions hold the contemplative life in great esteem for its asceticism and its search for the absolute. I think of places like Tibet and India and, other pl and Japan where Buddhist monasteries and Hindu monasteries have a very important role in their country. They understand the meaning of contemplation. It's not Christian contemplation, but Christians who are contemplatives can go there and be a great source of benefit to those regions. Now he addresses institutes of active life, like my own order, the Jesuits, and many other orders that are committed to the active life. I would recommend the immense opportunities for works of charity, for the proclamation of the gospel, for Christian education, cultural endeavors, and solidarity with the poor and those suffering from discrimination, abandonment, and oppression. Whether they pursue a strictly missionary goal or not, these active institutes should ask themselves how willing and able they are to broaden their action in order to extend God's kingdom. In recent times, many institutes have responded to this request, which I hope will be given even more consideration and implementation for a more authentic service. The church needs to make known the great gospel values of which she is the bearer. No one witnesses more effectively to these values than those who profess the consecrated life of poverty, chastity, and obedience. In a total gift of self to God and a complete readiness to serve humanity and society after the manner of Christ. And this here he cites Evangelii Nunziandi, Pope Paul VI's uh, document on missions. Religious, for their part, find in their consecrated life a privileged means of effective evangelization. At the deepest level of their being, they are caught up in the dynamism of the church's life, which is thirsty for the divine absolute and called to holiness. It is this holiness that they bear witness to. They embody the church in her desire to give herself completely to the radical demands of the Beatitudes, and that's what religious should live out, the Beatitudes. By their lives, they are a sign of total availability to God, the church, and the brethren. That's the role of, of religious. He also says in paragraph 70, I want to extend a special word of appreciation to missionary religious sisters, in whom virginity for the sake of the kingdom is transformed into a motherhood in the spirit that is rich and fruitful. It is precisely the mission agentes that offers them a vast scope for the gift of self with love in total and undivided manner. The example and activity of women who through virginity are consecrated to love of God and neighbor, especially to the poor, are an indispensable evangelical sign among those peoples and cultures where women have far to go on the way to human promotion and liberation. It's my hope that many young women will be attracted to religious life and follow them to the missions. May we all be missionaries in our places. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.